<laughs> Good morning. It's, we're into Marx again. And um, take a look on page um, one, or page 54. The conception of history, therefore, rests on the exposition of the real process of production. Real. Real? Well, real comes from the Latin word res, which means thing. Real? Uh, okay, what, is, what does real mean? Well, it's not ideal. That's Hegel. It's real. Read. Material. Okay? And what's material for Marx? Well, it's the, the economic. So if you want to understand history, you understand it in terms of economics and or the forces of production in the society. Um, so the conception of history therefore rests on the exposition of the real process of production. Um, <clears throat> production, remember? Um, he's not into hunters and gatherers. They don't produce. They get hunt and gather. <clears throat> um, starting out from the simple material production of life. Okay? In other words, not until you hit agriculture do you get the real basis for a society. Um, <clears throat> unlike, about the uh, middle of that bottom paragraph, unlike the idealist view of history, Hegel, <clears throat> unlike the idealist view of history, it does not have to look for a category in each period. Well, there are categories in each period. Um, there was the Roaring Twenties. That's before your time. And it's kind of, that's before my time too, but. Anyway, the, um, uh, there was also the Gay Nineties. That's way before my time. And there, uh, the, but there was the Sixties. Well, you don't remember the Sixties. The Sixties were, that was during the time of the protests against the Vietnam War and uh, social, there was a great deal of social unrest. Um, so that's what Hegel's way of doing history would look at. The character of a particular period in history, otherwise known as the Zeitgeist, the, the spirit of a particular time. Um, okay. <clears throat> Uh, but remains constantly on the real ground of history, and the real ground of history is the material and therefore the economic, the forces of production, <clears throat> which predominate in a particular society at a particular uh, period in its history. It does not explain practice from the idea, as, he as would Hegel, but explains the formation of ideas from material practice. And accordingly comes to the conclusion that all the forms and products of consciousness can be dissolved not by intellectual criticism. Okay, intellectual criticism. <clears throat> now we're going to get into Feuerbach. Okay. <clears throat> um, so what is intellectual criticism about? Well, <clears throat> um, give you a quote. <clears throat> uh, this is from uh, <clears throat> the introdu introductory line to the contributions to the critique of Hegel's philosophy of right. For Germany, the criticism of religion, the criticism of religion, Criticism of religion <clears throat> is the pre is in the main complete, right? Bandict. It is in the main complete, and it was completed by uh, Feuerbach. Okay. <clears throat> uh, 
And the criticism of religion is the premise of all religion. Okay, so what is, what is the uh, Feuerbach's criticism of religion? Feuerbach sets out, as he said, okay, <clears throat> in the, um, okay. Feuerbach, so, so what does Feuerbach say? Theology is anthropology and physiology. Okay, <clears throat> theology is, that is in his uh, essence of Christianity, uh, which was from 1841. <clears throat> and physiology <clears throat> is uh, the essence of religion, <clears throat> and that is in 1851. So what is the, <clears throat> um, well, <clears throat> we can put it in a nice little Latin phrase that homo, homini, deus, est. <clears throat> man is to man, that's God. What man is to man, that's God. Homo, homini, Deus est. What is he saying there? Um, <clears throat> man's God, okay, God for man, <clears throat> is the deified essence of man. <clears throat> How does he get there? Where should we start? Um, how, do, how does for man for God for man is the deified essence of man? What do we say about God? Well, God is omnipotent, omnipotent, or God is omniscient. <clears throat> God is all-powerful. God is all-knowing. Okay. How do we get that? Well, each of us individual human beings is finite. However, what we do, <clears throat> we, we, uh, if we all get together, <laughs> we're not all powerful, each one of us individually, but hum humanity is, if you put all human beings together, what do you get? Well, if you put uh, all human minds together, what do you get? You get something <clears throat> which is all-knowing. We don't, each, individually, we don't know everything. <clears throat> but we project that knowledge, right? We all get together and project that knowledge to God. Now, this is, um, humanity does this, but each individual nation does this, right? In other words, what is God for the Germans? Well, God is Odin. <clears throat> um, and who's Odin? Well, he's the God of war. And of course, the Germans have conducted wars periodically, like first World War I, World War II, <clears throat> and, and of course they were conducting wars against the French constantly, <clears throat> and because they're neighbors. Um, uh, so what, Odin is a god of, uh, it's, it's the projection of the German people. And in the same way that uh, it is said that uh, God 
is a good Frenchman. Well, I mean, for all, how do the Frenchmen look upon God? Well, what is it? God is le bon Dieu. Okay? The good God. Good, good. So God is the good Frenchman. That's the way the French view God, right? <clears throat> so it's not simply humanity as a whole. It's also each, each nation projects its own view, uh, vision or view of God. Um, in, de in fact, uh, <laughs> Feuerbach goes so far, so far as to say, if we were birds, we would project God as super bird? <clears throat> we would project God as a, a, a big bird. Right. Big bird, that's Sesame Street? Yeah, okay. <clears throat> anyway, the, um, uh, so it's also the, it's the projection of not simply humanity as a whole, we all get together and, and uh, project, where did I put that word project? I didn't. <clears throat> uh, and we project that particular view of, God is a projection of, of humanity or uh, of the individual nation or humanity or nation more particularized. Okay, <clears throat> so um, Feuerbach sets out from the fact of religion's self-alienation. Okay, the self, okay, alienation is, become, is going to become uh, an absolutely central notion in Marx. Uh, alienation will be absolute, become absolutely essential. But it, its, its basis is in uh, religion and above all, religion as viewed by Feuerbach. Um, <clears throat> so what does he say? Feuerbach sets out from the fact of religious self-alienation. Religious self-alienation. Well, wait a minute. If I project this particular image of God, uh, well, as being all-knowing, all-knowing? Individually, I'm not all-knowing, but all of us together, if we pool our minds, we can, we can know a lot. Okay, so, however, in the process, you know, we project, the, we, humanity, projects this particular image of God. However, remember, <clears throat> we're not all-knowing. <laughs> we have finite, we have finite abilities and finite knowledge. Uh, so, that means that uh, religion involves self-alienation, right? Because God is, uh, God is, uh, well, God is the opposite of what we are, right? Okay? God is the opposite of what we are. We're finite knowers, but God is all-knowing. Well, if we project that view of God, what happens to ourselves? <laughs> <clears throat> Okay, so where does that leave us? Um, uh oh, I lost my place. How do we define the human being? We define something in terms of its opposite, right? In the case of the essence of Christianity, the opposite is, of course, God. We define ourselves relative to God. When we, however, uh, the, this later work, 1851, <clears throat> Feuerbach says, and uh, anthropology and physiology, uh, uh, don't understand physiology as the physiology of the human body, right? Um, we define the human being in terms of its opposite. Well. Uh, what is the opposite of human? Well, for example, animal. 
Uh, but also, um, <clears throat> in terms of the opposite, for example, nature, right? Physi, well, <laughs> physis, physis equals nature. That's what the Greek word for nature. So <clears throat> we define the human being in terms of opposite. One of those opposites is God. Another is nature. Um, well, what is, what is, uh, what is the not animals, because animals, uh, what, it, okay, is, how does, how does um, Feuerbach view human nature? Well, Human nature is hmm, member and ensemble of relations. Uh, let's see, an ensemble of social relations. Let's consider a social relation. Well, the particular man, he's the social relation. He's the head of a family. So he's a husband. Uh, he's a father. Uh, what else? He belongs to Rotary. He's a factory worker. Or what? No, let's see. he he works for um, uh, Microsoft. <laughs> worker. Well, he's, he's a worker wherever he works. <clears throat> he's also a member of the church choir. And of course, the church choir that he's going to be a member of will depend upon his social, i.e., economic status. If, he's, if he works for uh, Microsoft, he is very likely um, going to be an Episcopalian. <clears throat> if he works for, what's a lesser employment in Seattle? Um, <laughs> if, he, if, he, if, he, if he works for, uh, if, if, he work, if, if he's a truck driver, right, put it that way, he probably belongs to some evangelical church. Right? So it, uh, the, the, the kind of social, rela the kind of social relation, the kind of economic, sta his economic status will determine also a social status. Uh, well, we see that if, if the, in the difference between a, a white collar and a blue collar worker. Okay? They're different economic statuses. And so, um, so he's a husband, he's a father, he's a factory worker. Um, he sings in the church choir. He's, he coaches Little League, right? And of course, he belongs to the twelfth man, or he is the twelfth one of the twelfth men. Uh, in other words, he roots for the Seattle Seahawks. Oh. Um, now, those are, are he, he is an, an ensemble of social relations. Uh, uh, ensemble, what is? An ensemble is like a, um, uh, a string quartet would be an ensemble. Uh, a jazz group would be an ensemble. Um, <clears throat> uh, what is this? It's, a, it's a, an assembly, a collection. Um, I, I need a better word there, but it doesn't come to me at the moment. Um, so, How do you define the human being? Well, you define the human being in terms of his social relationships. That's who uh, John Joe Black is. Yeah. 
<clears throat> However, you can also define the human being in terms of nature. Aha! Because that's also an opposite to the human being. Um, so, the uh, Feuerbach, um, he, uh, Marx says over on page 68, the middle of the paragraph, uh, Roman numeral 5, Feuerbach, not satisfied with abstract thought, right? um, as for example, uh, might be characteristic of Hegel. Incidentally, uh, Marx, uh, uh, Feuerbach studied uh, with Hegel from around 1824, 1825, uh, until, 18, his, until Hegel's death in 1831. Right? So, um, and of course, needless to say, uh, Feuerbach is one of the left, the young Hegelians, otherwise known as the left-wing Hegelians. Um, uh, because, needless to say, uh, Hegel would not have agreed with what Marx has to say, or what Feuerbach and Marx has to say about religion. Um, <clears throat> Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so every god is a creature of the imagination. Okay, it's a projection. An image, and specifically an image of man. Um, <clears throat> God, we sometimes uh, is, um, well, God has this long white beard, uh, white flowing robes, right? That's, that's an image of God. <laughs> and we, we, we have images of, uh, and incidentally, that image will have a certain ethnic basis, too. For example, uh, if you look at, there are pictures of Jesus, right? which make him look like a 19th century romantic esthete, basically. I mean, he's, <clears throat> and he's European. However, uh, in the Orient, um, God has slanty eyes. <laughs> because it's, it's, remember, it's a cultural projection. So, uh, the image of man, but he is uh, an image which man places outside himself, outside himself, and over and above himself, uh, and conceives of as an independent being. Okay, so it's uh, the, 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 view, the view we have of God is going to be the opposite of the view uh, that we have uh, is going to be the opposite of ours. We're do, we define God in terms of opposites. Either the opposite um, of us, right, and as an independent, um, but as omnipotent and all-knowing, this represents a form of self-alienation. And alienation, as I say, is going to become absolutely central um, <clears throat> to um, Marx's uh, uh, project. Um, well, as I said earlier, um, I'll get it. For Germany, the criticism of religion is in the main complete, and Feuerbach completed it. And criticism of religion is the premise of, of all religion and uh, of all philosophy, too, so far as um, uh, Marx is concerned. Okay, <clears throat> let's take a look over on page 55. Top of the page there. Um, but at each stage of history, okay, there is found a material result. Um, well, uh, we have, there are different ages. Uh, there's the Stone Age. Uh, there's the Bronze Age. There's the Iron Age. Uh, what else? There's the Iron Age. 
There's the, uh, the, the steel age. And of course, there's the plastic age. Uh, that's the one we live in. Okay, so, um, but at each stage of history, there is found a material result. Indeed, you can go back uh, and if you, fi you can find stone tools in uh, archeolo archeological digs where they have, they're where there are human bones or they think they're human. And if they find tools there, uh, especially t stone tools, uh, that gives them uh, an indication that this is a human um, uh, human skeleton. So, uh, a there's always found a material result. A sum of productive forces. Um, <clears throat> uh, all kinds of bronze objects, um, which have turned green. Uh, some of it, a, a historically created relation uh, of individuals to nature and to one another, uh, which is handed down to each generation from its predecessors, right? Um, <clears throat> a mass of productive forces, capital and circumstances, uh, which is indeed modified by the new generation, but which also prescribes for it its conditions of life and gives it a definite development, a definite uh, character. Well, I mean, after all, uh, there is uh, feudalism, F-E-U-D-A-L-I-S-M, right? Um, characteristic of uh, the medieval period. Um, and what is characteristic of um, the medieval period? Well, you had serfs and you had feudal lords. Uh, and as <clears throat> Marx will say, the serf does not inherit the land. The land inherits the serf. The serf belongs to the land. But as, as we will see in Marx, uh, the Lord also belongs to the, to the land, right? Um, he's called Lord Norf Norfolk before, because he is the Lord of the Norfolk estate and name. Does he have an individual name? No. He's just Norfolk. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Let's uh, flip over to page uh, 56. Thus, the man... Uh, Thus, the relation of man to nature is excluded from history. Ooh. The relation of man to nature is excluded from history. There's a, there's a, there's nature and there's history. This, is, this becomes almost canonic in the 19th century. Um, uh, <clears throat> Thus, the relation of man to nature is excluded from history, and in this way, the antithesis between nature and history is established. Um, okay. Uh, skipping down a sentence there. For instance, if an epic imagines itself to be actuated, actuated by purely political or religious motives, well, think in terms of, say, well, Northern Ireland uh, in recent history, um, the, it was supposedly a, um, a religious conflict between the North, uh, Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic uh, and the IRA. But the, um, Marx would say, no, the, <clears throat> it was an economic the, the difficulty of the, uh, the, the conflict in Northern Ireland, uh, Marx would say, no, it wasn't religious, it was economic. There were there only, a, it was a limited economy, uh, and there were only enough jobs to go around for maybe half. So the, the conflict, according to Marx, was not religious, in other words, Northern Protestants, Irish Catholics, uh, it was rather economic. Right? Um, similarly, uh, in Bosnia, the same sort of thing, where you had uh, Muslims and you had the Serbs, right? Um, the, you might think, well, it's, it was uh, a conflict between religions. No, Marx would say, no. It was when, with the breakup of, the Yugosla of Yugoslavia, um, there were the, uh, there were, the economy could support, couldn't support everybody. And so they uh, 
the fighting brought out, uh, broke out because there was um, uh, <clears throat> an argument over basically uh, the wealth of what was left of um, <clears throat> Yugoslavia. Uh, similarly, um, well, uh, in in the in the Near East, like for example, Bahrain, uh, which is um, only what, 15 or 16 percent uh, Shiite, the country is ruled by the Sunnis, right? So, you, is, and is is this for religious reasons? Uh, Marx would say no. It's 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 basically economic. And then he goes back to um, <clears throat> the uh, older uh, divisions in society. For example, a caste system, as in as occurs as exists in India, uh, and the caste system. Uh, there are about five different castes in India. Uh, the uh, the Brahmins uh, are the top caste, <laughs> and. They're the lightest, right? <clears throat> and the bottom caste are the untouchables. <laughs> <clears throat> the um, uh, I forget the uh, exact name. Anyway, the uh, uh, Marx would say the caste system is not social. It's not political, right? So much as it is economic and. Uh, uh, certain truth to that. Okay, so where did that leave us? Um, we're still talking about history, right? Um, within the framework, of, okay, within the framework, uh, page 57, within the framework of empirical exoteric history, Hegel introduced the opera operation of a speculative esoteric history. Well, the esoteric history is that of uh, spirit. Right? Um, <clears throat> the history of humanity becomes a history of the abstract spirit of uh, a spirit above and beyond the real person. Right? Uh, well, remember, uh, for Hegel, there is the uh, the cunning of reason, remember, list de vernunft, the cunning of reason, in other words, God using human passions and emotions in order to achieve his goals in history. Um, <clears throat> spirit above and beyond the real person. Uh, and real, of course, again, means res, material, economic. Um, already with Hegel, down at the middle of uh, the bottom paragraph there, already with Hegel, the absolute spirit of history has its materials in the masses, but only finds adequate expression in philosophy. Uh, remember, for Hegel, uh, the world is to be given a philosophical form. For Marx, on the other hand, um, philosophy is to be given a worldly form. Um, but the philosopher appears merely as the instrument by which absolute spirit, which makes history, for Hegel, arrives at self-consciousness after the historical movement has been completed. Uh, the philosopher's share in history is thus limited to this subsequent consciousness. The philosopher arrives post-festum. In other words, after the feast is over, the philosopher arrives, arri arrives to pick up the pieces. Remember the Owl of Minerva takes its light in the evening after, in the evening of the, uh, of the uh, um, life uh, of a particular uh, nation. Okay, bottom paragraph on page 57. Just as for the earlier the teleological thinkers, plants existed only in order to be eaten by animals, hmm. and animals only in order to be eaten by man, hmm. so history, exists only to satisfy the need for consuming theoretical <laughs> nourishment for demonstration. In other words, um, so far as H Hegel is, or excuse me, so far as Marx is concerned, history, <clears throat> you write history, history is, you're grinding axes. 
In other words, you write history because that's the history you want to have written, because that's the history um, that you see as describing the real situation in the particular society. Uh, need for consuming theoretical nourishment for demonstration, right? In other words, you want to demonstrate some particular idea. Man exists so that history shall exist. Um, however, in writing history, you all, the historian also makes history. Um, and uh, uh, that's going to be history for Marx, right? The history that he would write, or, how, or better, uh, rewrite. In, da in fact, Marx maintains, uh, history needs to be rewritten in every age. And uh, in accordance with <clears throat> what you wish to see happen. <clears throat> okay, uh, over on page 59, uh, the third line from the top. When the ideologists, think Hegel, when the ide ideologists had thus assumed that ideas and thoughts dominated past history, that's Hegel, all right, that the history of ideas was the whole of past history, that's Hegel, when they had assumed that the real conditions were modeled on man and his ideal conditions, mm -hmm. <clears throat> that's Hegel, that is, upon his determination, in short, when they had laid the history of the consciousness of the consciousness men have of themselves, the basis of their real history, nothing was easier than to call the history of mind ideas of the sacred of representation the history of man, and to substitute that for real history. <clears throat> um, um, as um, uh, Marx will say later in the German ideology, right? Nicht das Bewusstsein bestimmt das Leben, sondern das Leben bestimmt das Bewusstsein. Which means, it's not consciousness that determines life, as Hegel might think. Rather, it is life that determines consciousness. Okay. <clears throat> um, over on page 60, I'm starting to get tired, so let's quit soon. <clears throat> okay, we must begin by stating first uh, the presupposition of all human existence and therefore of all history, uh, namely that men must be in a position to live in order to be able to make history. Well, primum vivere. <clears throat> if, you, if you're not alive, you're not going to be making much history, much less writing it. <clears throat> okay, moving down to the middle of that paragraph. The Germans, as is well known, have never done this. In other words, written real histories. Um, they have never, therefore, had an earthly basis for history, and consequently never an historian. Um, um, well, um, who was the, well, needless to say, the, the English obviously had uh, a very good historian, um, uh, Gibbon, right? The decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Um, but Theodore Mommsen also uh, in Germany, he, was, he wrote the, uh, about um, <clears throat> the uh, ancient world too. Uh, but anyway, the Germans, as is well known, have never done this. They have never, therefore, had an earthly basis for history, and consequently never an historian. Well, uh, <coughs> that's kind of a harsh judgment. But. Okay, uh, down to the bottom of page 61, he says, the family, which is, first, is at first the only social relationship, uh, obviously, Hegel would agree, um, the family is the basic social unit. Um, the family, which is, is at first the only social relationship, becomes later when increased needs create new uh, social relations, and the increased population new needs, a subordinate one, uh, except in Germany and must then be treated and analyzed according to the existing empirical data, not according to the concept 
of the family, as is the custom in Germany. Well, remember, um, <clears throat> what causes the nature of the family to change in a particular society, <clears throat> um, Hegel would say that society determines the nature of the family. Um, needless to say, Marx would say, oh yeah, that's true. Um, but it's, it's for economic reasons. It's for economic reasons. As he says, by social is meant the cooperation of several individuals, no matter under what conditions, um, in what manner, or to what end. It follows from this, that a determinate mode of, in, of production or industrial stage is always bound up with the determinant mode of operation. In other words, in an industrialized society, you're going to have a certain form of um, social interaction, right? <clears throat> in other words, the meaning of the human being in such a situation is going to be in relation to the economics of that particular situation. Um, <clears throat> and not only the uh, not only the politics will flow from the economics, but also the legal, the religious, everything else. Okay, let's quit. And um, <clears throat> the, uh, again, credits, do, do thanks to the, for the technological assistance of Brother Damien.